Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, and this is your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, I'm here in Vancouver, British Columbia for the International Cannabis Business Conference. We're going to be talking about everything that is Canada. <laughs> We're going to be talking about everything that is Canadian cannabis. On the line with us to help us dissect all of that is Dan Chemis, our CBD correspondent somewhere on the road in America. I'll be flying back tonight. I will not be bringing cannabis. I drove up with a friend of ours uh, the other day, came up here uh, across the border, no issues. But it is funny asking people, what's your story? So we are here officially for a music festival, Westward Music Festival, I think. Um, and officially other people are here visiting friends. There is one of our friends, Mike West, uh, an old school extractor, like the first guy I met five, six years ago, um, deep into extraction, and phenomenal at it, works with universities, works with uh, folks all over the world. And so Mike West is here, he moved here, and he has to tell people what he does for a living. So I find that fascinating that he gets pulled over every single time he crosses the border. So today, today's International Cannabis Business Conference in Vancouver has some special guests like John Sally, NBA champion and actor uh, with pieces, daughters. Yo. There's an after party today on some yacht. I'm going to have to miss that because I got to fly back. Uh, DJ Muggs of Cypress Hill was spinning the ones and twos last night for the VIP party. Um, today, though, I'm going to be checking out some British Columbia regulations. There's Cannabis Edibles 2.0 coming out. And so we'll start to see internationally how edibles works, uh, including concentrates that are not just CO2, but uh, you know butane and ethanol and uh, propane and some other stuff that gets released between October and uh, December. So there's upcoming regulations for edibles. So that'll be an interesting topic. I'm gonna check out mergers and acquisitions. Of course, I wanna see kind of what's happening with that. And our friend Paul Peterson of Next Leaf is on the panel. I'll be chatting with him later on today. Um, and then Canadian craft cannabis should be a good one. International export, obviously wanna stay on top of that, see where that's gonna be heading. Talking to our friend AC Braddock of Eden Labs with extraction science and kind of how this whole hoopla of, of uh, toxic carts is kind of affecting the market. I'm sure they'll be speaking about that. And then to wrap it up at 420 is strategic partnerships. Um, and so again, uh, Tyler Sally of uh, Deuces 22 is on that panel. So we'll be with them later on today. So kind of lots, lots to, uh, to listen to today as... Um, you know, Canadian sales kind of ramp up their 2.0 versions here next month, looking at uh, this MJ Business Daily graph about cannabis sales stall in Canada after adult use, uh, legalization, affordability, and access are all considers, uh, are all factors to consider. There's no medical market up here, so they're trying to block all of these dispensaries. My hotel actually has one connected to it. And I was super excited. I got here and I'm like, yes, there's a dispensary in my hotel. But it's one of those medical ones that's closed down and they, they don't have the cement blocks put up against it. But there is a sign that says we're still trying to work with Health Canada and uh, get some access. So as a lot of those stores have shut down, no medical programs, of course, you're going to see a decrease in sales as maybe the extract's not as good. Maybe the edibles aren't as good. Maybe the flour is moldy. That's all been sent back by Quebec and other provinces as the you know, quality isn't as good as the black market up here. It's kind of like California. They've been doing a long time and they've got really good product. Funny, right? Again, something about a in-place supply chain, because it always comes back to distribution time and again. Can you get it and can you get it to the customer? If you can, well, then you do and you make some bank. And these days, the crew that can up there, yeah, yeah. The old school, right? The old, the OG. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. So it looks like, you know, dried cannabis and cannabis oil is, is slightly coming down from October to June. And so it is definitely trending. Now, there was an uptick in, in April with dried cannabis, probably a 420. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there is a, a little bit of a dip that you can see as sales start to decrease and so uh, looking at the MJ Business Daily article, so the demand in the medical industry as of June saw dried medical cannabis uh, down almost 2,000 kilograms the same month that it was legalized in Canada. 
So they're seeing medical cannabis oil sales rising, but only slightly. Uh, and then after years of steady growth, the number of active client registration holders plateaued. Obviously, they couldn't transfer over. And that's what we're seeing at, at in my hotel with, with that vacant dispensary right there. I don't even know where the closest one is. I need to find one before this conference starts. I'll tell you that. Um, and there's more patients that are registering, but it doesn't really equate to sales if they don't have a store to go to. And so um, Alberta, for example, went from 110,000 registered patients to 94,000. So they're dropping off for whatever reason. And I'm sure that the taxes and the, the higher prices all kind of come into effect in every single emerging market. Uh, and there's no difference here in Canada. Well, yeah, the, the lack of, you know, again, they start the system, but then they don't have the capacity to sustain the new regulatory and distribution system, right? And again, you want to be a good customer. You want to play by the rules. You want to play fair. But who has the weed, right? Well, again, not the store that's got the cement blocks in front of the door, right? It doesn't have the weed. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, some of these companies are still showing signs of life off in some of the public markets, you know, with Aurora and Canopy and Tilray and some of these companies. Uh, between the, the beginning of the year and, and 420, there was a massive spike, right? And then the, the, a correction, essentially, people taking profits off the table and those shares of those stocks seeing a decline. And so looking at Tilray, um, Tilray was down 2% last week at $25 per share. It was trading near $32 at the time of publication. Kronos was halved from its February high of $25 when it bottomed in August 28th at 10 bucks. And then Aurora Cannabis has been more than halved at its peak of $12, recently dropped to $5. And Canopy Growth peaked at uh, $59 in October and um, is no longer there. <laughs> But basically, uh, 28 bucks is that where Canopy is at now. It's 23% off its high. So, I, you know, I don't necessarily think that um, that's a bad thing. It, it, when you see something parabolic, obviously, it's going to have a correction at, at some point. Um, but what you are seeing is the Bank of Montreal not allowing shorting of stock due to high volatility. I find that fascinating. We haven't seen banks step in and say, you can't short stock in and except for in 2009, I worked for Capital One, a brokerage firm where I was managing a $650 million fund at the time and saw all of this as the, the, the dot-com or the housing crash uh, collapsed in 2008, 2009, uh, and they stopped shorting. You weren't allowed to bet against a stock uh, to hedge it as it goes down. So already seeing like Montreal forbidding shorting cannabis stock due to high volatility. And it, I don't even think it's a volatile market yet. Funny, again, you know, the, to watch the, the major players, you know, protect themselves. And you know that when the bank is doing it, right, keep an eye on things, brother, right? Listen to the talking hedge. You don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to be interesting if they are already doing that. Some other, you know, institutions might. We've seen a, a huge increase. Just last week, uh, we covered some ETFs and uh, a lot of the finance moves in the markets and saw that there's more ETFs out there. So it's not just the ETF alternative harvest in index, but there's five or six now uh, in the U S and, and that's not even the leveraged funds. So there's uh, two X leveraged uh, uh, funds that you can get if, if it's not risky enough for you on the upside and downside. Um, <laughs> and, and so they just kind of keep increasing in, in options. And so with that, let's kind of look at some of the capital raises that we've kind of seen over the last week in terms of absolute numbers. In August, the number of deals closed was 38. It's uh, just one fewer than the month before. But the amount that was raised, $972 million compared to $369 million. So uh, it's definitely a lot more money. The average size of each raise was $25 million in 2019 compared to 9.5 million a year ago. That's crazy. That's three times the amount of money coming in, even though some of the deals are, are decreasing in numbers, the, the dollar amounts are increasing. Zany, right? 3X growth. That's, you know, again, I love listening to this podcast. 
So here's a couple of takeaways, you know, analysis and trends based on market moves according to uh, MJ Business Daily. So 2019 capital raises by type, you're looking at um, M&A market, capital raises predominantly focused on cultivation or retail. So that's kind of a, a move away from branding. I find that fascinating. Through the end of August 2019, there's a total of five and a half billion dollars raised compared with 3.5 billion last year. So not quite double, but close. Public companies dominated overall equity raises in August, which I would expect. They contributed 630 million to the total figure of 900 million. So two thirds of all, all of that money was, was raised uh, um, in August alone. So the companies with just 176 million raised by public companies in August emitted an overall equity raise of 330 million in public markets in August. Uh, looking at transaction M&As last week, uh, cultivation and retail, like we said, dominated August. And so the sector with the most established in the industry is facing consolidation, even as multi-state operators expand into new markets. So in August, 75% of acquirers came from cultivation and retail. Um, only 42% of transaction invite buyers in that sector. And so year to date, you have 120 of 259 M&As in cannabis involved in companies in cultivation and retail compared with 58 out of 206 transactions last year. Um, so double. Uh, I find that really fascinating. We just reported that uh, TJ's Gardens in Oregon sold for $12.5 million. That's a market that has six and a half years supply excess, right? And yet $12.5 million was more than 10% more than what High Times paid for Dope Magazine. Uh, and Zoots and Edibles Company, also $11.5 million was, was purchased. So a lot of money being thrown around. Um, and I'm still surprised by TJ's Gardens in Oregon going to $12.5 million. Looks like some farms are finally starting to get uh, as they've been ignored for so long. Eight-figure deals, right? Eight-figure deals happening in the cannabis space. Who would have thought? And then the, the fact is, you know, one of my taglines when I'm out talking about the show is, you know, what's the value of a better decision when you're moving eight figures? And they're happening all the time now. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you're definitely starting to see bigger moves. So there's a Yahoo Finance article about institutional investors from Credit Suisse to Citigroup helping to fund cannabis companies last month. So they're definitely not waiting for uh, the federal government to step in. Um, I find it interesting that we're starting to see the House banking bill heading for a landmark U.S. House vote. So what that means is banking is actually going to be voted on, um, uh, which, is, which is fascinating. So it's never even reached this point yet where the, the House is going to be able to vote on whether or not to allow cannabis. Um, so D.C. lawmakers are, are ready for that. You can see Senate panels want cannabis banking vote by the end of the year. Um, all of these headlines are starting to pop through, which is, which is really exciting. But really, it's just about- What do you think? Hmm? What do you think? Are they, are they going to take the money? Are they going to let the cannabis dollars into the system, Chronic? What do you think? I do. I, I believe this is all a Petri dish experiment. I think that the, these financial institutions know more than we do. Um, and if they're allowing it, it means they've been given the green light. And this is, we've already known this though, because the government's been trying to get banks to lend and they just won't do it, starting to do it now. And I think that's a massive indication that they're going to, uh, allow for it eventually without losing their, their, their bank charter or license or, or whatever. Um, it's, it's going to be fascinating as more money comes in for automation, scaling, uh, going interstate, international, definitely going to be a, a massive consolidation wave. Uh, I have no doubt about that. So you're seeing uh, LeafLink. Okay, they're on a tear. They got a million dollars for a thousand subscribers. That's an e-commerce website, right? And then they got a $15 million Series A last week that reported on. And apparently they have a $35 million Series B that they just got. So that was really, really quick. Uh, and you can't do that without major... Um, either venture capital getting you access to a syndicate or to a bank. Um, but, you know, Canada is the place to be, I guess. And there's FOMO being created as you see all of these other investments being driven by banking industries. There's Bestoke, 
Viso Capital Acquisitions throwing a $350 million IPO. Um, Gemacert, $12 million Israeli raise. Hound Labs, $30 million Series D. <laughs> D. Um, and so, yeah, this Benzinga article is interesting because without the backing of Credit Suisse and Citigroup, those are U.S. companies, right? We're not talking about Deutsche Bank, Europe, or uh, Canadian capital up here. These are U.S. banks. That's a massive indicator that I would, uh, you know, put on the forefront as, as moving and moving quickly. They know something we don't. That's, that's definitely the case here. And I think that um, if you're in the industry, take that as a good sign and, and prepare because you're either going to be put out of business, you're going to be consolidated, uh, or you're going to have an opportunity, depending on what you do, to get some capital, automate your pre-roll joint systems, uh, you know, increase your yields on, uh, on derivatives like CBG, CBN, THCV. Uh, there's opportunities, but I don't think a lot of people will be able to take advantage of those opportunities because they're so overwhelmed that they'll probably just capitulate, meaning uh, a forced merger. They'll just sell out. That's, that's my guess. That whole concept, I'm still trying to recover from you saying somebody would know something that we don't. I can't believe that <laughs> here on the Talking Hedge, your uh, cannabis business podcast. Yes, sir. I mean, that's, that's the benefit of, of being in DC and, and, you know, follow the money. Banks definitely know more than we do and they're leading the charge with lending. So I think that's a massive indicator. But having said that, we also know that they have uh, rights that we don't. They're not going to be prosecuted. They're not going to have a bank check. Down. You've seen that with CBD, right? With uh, Kroger and all those companies being able to sell CBD products and the little mom and pops getting their bank account shut down. So although you might be uh, getting influenced by these companies and wanting to follow suit, just remember you're small, you're an individual, you're not a corporation, you don't have the, the legal rights that a company does. And so uh, tread carefully. So if that were to roll this one up, I'm Josh Kincaid, this is The Talking Hedge. I'm in Vancouver for the International Cannabis Business Conference. Dan is on the ground. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out.